Okay, guys, here we go. I am here with Christopher Townsend, the visual effects supervisor for Marvel Studios Captain Marvel. Thank you so much for talking with You're us. You're very welcome. We are here in the Frank G. Wells building on the Disney lot, and this is where the magic happens, right? This is where some of the magic happens. The edit suites are up there, the directors are up there. Um, sort of every day we're all getting together and talking about the film and how to make it better. So there are so many fun things to tackle in this film in particular because you have other worlds, you have aliens, you have superpowers. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Captain Marvel's powers. We see in the very first trailer her binary powers come to life. It's really, really exciting to see, yeah. uh, but there's so much to that. So if we sort of look at the first shot, where do you even begin to come up with the concept for what that power is? Oh, it's. Uh... It's so interesting. Every time I start one of these movies, I think I have no idea how we're going to do this. Um, so you literally start with a blank sheet of paper in terms of what we can do. You look at the comic books, you look at video games, you look at art, you look at, you know, you look at all these different things. We have a visual development department here at Marvel who works on all the character designs for all the movies. And I think that, that so that one of the first things they do is start amassing all this reference and start illustrating and drawing up these sort of these individual um, ideas and these frames. One of the things that uh, Anna Bowden and Ryan Fleck, the directors of the film, that what they've brought to the film is this sort of very naturalistic feel. So what was really exciting was how do you make a big superhero movie but keep it naturalistic and keep it grounded in reality? We were fortunate enough to have the, the ability to shoot Brie Larson, who is Captain Marvel, um, when she was shooting on a, on, a, on a test for another film. We photographed her in what we thought were some good poses and some shooting some photon blasts and taking into a binary power and all this kind of stuff. And we started working on the, the, the effects. We started to, we, we brought that footage into the, into the computer and we took scans of Brie to, so that we can knew all her dimensions and photographs of her and we could actually build a physical CG model or a CG model of her that then matched her real model, her real, her real body. We track all that to the photography so that we now have a digital version of that in the computer. And then we started with simulations and sort of keyframe art over the top of Brie. And then we started working on simulations and many, many layers and many months of, of work just trying to create the look of trying to find something which she doesn't look like she's on fire. Mm. Um, she can't look, you know, she, her energy has to feel strong. We can't, in, we can't go over her, her personality. So it was really trying to find all those bits and pieces. And then once you have that idea of what you want it to look like, you guys have put it through all of those layers and you start shooting, uh, how do you use practical elements like lights and those sort of things to help the visual effects process. It, it's always really tricky of knowing, oh, well, how much, where, where do you use interactive light and when don't you? And so one of the things we, we design, we had designed for the set and for Brie were these big sort of light bracelets that she wore, which is LED panels of lights on her, on her um, wrists. And sometimes we even put them on her body so that she could interactively light up the environment that she was walking through, but also she could light up her face. So a lot of her, her body is, is then digitally replaced or enhanced. Um, but obviously we want to keep her face and we want to keep the performance that she's giving. So uh, often it's very useful to have sort of when she's moving around with her lights on her wrists that you have the, the light moving appropriately. Well, I love it. It is very punk rock. And then I have to say this shot is so beautiful. The scroll transformation that we see on the beach, it's really the first time we get the full idea of what a scroll can do. Right. Um, how do you put together these shots because clearly there are two actors playing one role. It was interesting. It was one of the first, the first thing, the first mm -hmm. transformation we did, the first shape shifting we did, and uh, Ben Mendelsohn's our sort of lead scroll. Uh, and when when he sort of turned up on set, it was one of the first things that Anna and Ryan, the directors, spoke to him about. Like, okay, how do we do this? How 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 should we even you know what what does a scroll feel when he goes through this uh, this transformation, this shape shifting? Is it painful? Is it is it easy? Is it does it take a lot of effort? And I think so. A lot of that comes from the performance of what the actor is going to bring to it. And so uh, you know we we decided that it, yes, it does take a lot of effort. Um, it 
it's a very physiological thing that happens. It's a very mm -hmm. physical thing that should happen. It's not sort of a, a we didn't want it to feel like a just a, a morph between two things, mm -hmm. or just a sort of a dissolve. We wanted it to feel like there's things happening in the body. And one of the big things that we wanted to do is to use the grooves in the scroll's f face. Mm -hmm. the, the way they've always been illustrated, they've got these big grooves mm -hmm. in the chin and their sort of lines. So we really wanted to use that and have that be sort of almost splitting apart and then the other other characters sort of bursting out from, from within. So you have these two very distinct shots and you have this interesting component added to that, which is the movement of the camera. It seems like it must be such a long, sort of painstaking process. How many iterations does a shot like this go through? Well, there are, there are probably there, there are dozens of people that are working on a shot like this. Mm -hmm. it, it only took, we had one day to shoot it, the entire <laughs> sequence. And Perfect. We, yeah, I know. <laughs> so it's always, it's always a little bit rushed when you're dealing with light. And we tried to, we wanted, it was supposed to look like sunrise. Well, in fact, it's sunset because mm -hmm. that's the only time we could get there for the actual shoot. So it's it, the actual, it's somewhat chaotic when you're actually trying to shoot this. And then artists sit down and then they're starting to really work on it. So. It's probably, I think we got to version 350 or something that we actually, that they were finally submitting. Now, we haven't seen all of those versions. Mm -hmm. They've done many versions internally and that they're turning things around very quickly themselves. But it's a phenomenal amount of work that goes into a shot like that. And the, the painstaking work that goes into individual, you know, the hairs, the way her hair grows uh, halfway through the, the sort of the, the process, I said, wouldn't it be kind of fun if her hair just starts in a bun and then just falls down rather than just growing out of her head? So it's you're you're making it up as you go, you know, when mm -hmm. you're thinking about it and you're you're it's never sort of you don't go in with a, a plan of exactly how it's gonna go. You you always you're reacting to what you see. So it's a it's a fascinating process. I have a feeling this next character uh, got you into a real hairy situation because it's Goose the Cat. Um, cat actors, I assume, have some limitations that human actors don't. How much of Goose is visual effects and how much of Goose is your wonderful cat actor, Reggie? Reggie. Well, it wasn't just Reggie. So the oh, complicated really? thing was there were four cats on set. And uh, Reggie was our hero cat, but there was another cat that was good for being held, and there was another cat that was good for sitting. And so some of the shots are, you know, when the cat is floating, obviously it's not real, and because a real cat can't do that. But there are other shots where the cat is on somebody's lap and just sitting there and doing cat things. And a lot of that isn't the real cat either. A lot of that is the computer-generated cat. I think there were about 100 or so shots in the movie of the cat, and I think 70 of them are, are CG. Wow. So about two thirds of the shots are, are virtual. I've seen this side by side shot mm -hmm. of the VFX cat and the real life cat. I personally cannot tell them apart. How do you tell them apart? Um, one of them has got a collar on. So that's the big tell. That's the big tell. One of them has the collar and one of them doesn't. But yeah. What if you take off the collar? Mm, then it gets tricky. And that's the <laughs> whole point, right? That's what we're yeah. trying to do. And you're trying to, and that was really a proof of concept mm -hmm. uh, of just to see, you know, because obviously the, the, the challenging thing in this film is being able to match the shots so that you can go from the light, the real cat to the CG cat, back to a live cat, back to, and it's really, and you know, we, we, our job is to never take the audience out of the moment. So we have to nail that. And that was, that was incredibly challenging to get that. I love it through that lens so much. And you guys go see Marvel Studios' Captain Marvel in theaters now.